City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday night, the best night of the week, as far as I'm concerned, although unless you're listening to this on a Saturday, is Comp Center with Drew Breezy, where we break down 911 and police stuff that's always pretty much sad every week, but we have a good time while we're doing it. Drew Breezy, how are you doing? You look alive and well, and uh, why don't you break down tonight's show for us before we get started? Tonight, we're going to talk about the Tamir Rice case. If you don't remember that, that was the one that kind of kicked it all off. It was uh, a case out of Cleveland, Ohio, and back in 2014, I think it was. And um, a young 12-year-old boy was shot and tragically killed by uh, police officers. It turned out he had a toy gun. Um, so you may remember the case, but we're taking it from a different angle because there's definitely... Uh, some communication center dispatcher involvement in this. We had a dispatcher disciplined out of that case, but we're going to talk about whether that was fair or not. And, um, you know, obviously it was a tragedy and uh, mistakes were made, but uh, we're going to talk about that. John, are you disguising something uh, or do you have some kind of gadget hidden in your, or do you just have an itch? Uh, the shirt is actually just a dicky, and I'm almost completely nude. It's very <laughs> offensive in here. I reg- I don't know why we have costumes on a podcast. No one can see us. There are like 30 people, 25 people can see us. And there's some, you know, several hundreds or thousands of people who are like, why the fuck are they talking about costumes? Why are these grown men? And and the thing is, folks, this is how this went down. We were texting this week. I'm like, so, Drew, I sent you the media and the Tamir Rice thing. Stellar, thank you. Also, I sent over the calls. And he goes, let's dress like old-timey detectives this week. And I said, okay. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> right. We do not discuss things. We just do it that we're like yep. a weird old couple, like a couple of old detectives, maybe. I don't know. But there's it, really it was no actually good excuse. a test. Uh, it was a test because I was going to, what I was going to do is say, hey, we're going to dress like Planet of the Apes. But I did not have my uh, Planet of the Apes. Well, mask. I play the human whenever we play Planet of the Apes. I yeah, that's to- true. I'm in my my astronaut Taylor costume <laughs> while, while, you were, while you were out there doing you know, Dr. Zayas or something. God bless you. Uh, you know what we're going to talk about right now is a Chicago police officer that was left unpaid after being shot on duty. It's a wild story. It's not necessarily, a, oh, he's going to eat a cigarette. It's not necessarily um, one of, like, it, it, the last thing I want to do is get on the bad side of any administration, but I also want to call out when I see, you know, things happening to good people like the the good you know police officers that are out there trying to do their jobs and um they end up getting caught up in quagmire and uh, go broke you know trying to support their family as uh, as a result here's here's uh here's what happened um this was uh, a coincidence that um that happened to a chicago officer both of his parents by the way are retired chicago pd uh, he was shot in the line of duty about a year ago. His name is Anthony Grafeo. He got a uh, visceral demonstration of how police work can go from standing still to the to uh, speed of light in a flash. Um, the offender, he, he was in a restaurant, okay? The offender ordered food and was in line in front of the officer. The offender reached for his pocket to pay for the order and a gun fell out of his waistband. So, the offender's waistband. So before the officer could react, the suspect picked the gun up. He started firing. The bullet grazed the officer's head. The suspect then fired into a patrol car where this officer Grafeo was seated. And uh, he was waiting for his partner. And then seven bullets struck officer Grafeo in the left leg. Uh, nearby officers chased the suspect and apprehended him. The suspect wasn't injured. However, the the officer was so he was he received the medal of valor he spent three days in the hospital and he came home but he suffered an infection and it required four more days in the hospital and then he endured a series of surgeries related to six bullet fragments that are that are lodged in his legs and he's in excruciating pain that's the way it's described the fragments can't be removed our friend Deadleg knows all about this it's it's um you, you, though it may not be 
you know, uh, nerve pain caused by bullet fragments uh, in Deadlake's case, but it's some of this is affecting his sciatic nerve. The uh, injuries continue to prevent him from functioning uh, functioning normally. So um, it's making it not possible for him to return to work. And in the meantime, they're trying to decide, they being the city of Chicago, is trying to decide what to do with his medical status, right? So this... <laughs> So, so he sits at home, and uh, according to Fox 32 News, besides the cops, ordinary people are also fleeing Chicago in proverbial droves, rising crime rates, uh, 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 crime stats enhanced by the anti-police positions of political leaders are adding to the exodus. Uh, so uh, here, here it is. In fact, uh, in Chicago, chaos has become routine. What's shocking is how Officer Grafeo is being treated after taking seven rounds from an armed criminal from his uh, from his Chicago community while continuing his lengthy journey to recovery he has exhausted all of his allowed medical time and has pl been placed in a no pay status awaiting a disability hearing. Unfortunately, disability approval process can take eight to 10 months. Uh, there is a, there is a GoFundMe for this guy. I don't know where it is. I don't want to give you the wrong one. So we're not going to talk about that, but I'm sure you can find it on your own. Uh, but this is just a, a, a horrid case. The, the, the full story can be found on his GoFundMe account uh, explaining his medical condition and his financial situation. He's a f husband and a father to two beautiful girls, ages four and six. He's grateful every day to be alive, but he's in excruciating pain. And on top of that, he's in the mental pain of not knowing whether he's going to have a paycheck or a job. Or Now, uh, Drew, did you say this was Chicago PD? Is this the Windy City that's putting our boy down? <laughs> it's the old Windy City, yes. Is this the same Windy City that posthumously suspended hero police officer Ella French? Yes. Chicago, in, in... do better. This is ridiculous. <laughs> you get police officers shot. You stop paying them and you start suspending them. It's ridiculous. In in after her death, uh, Detective John is correct. Uh, Dick John is is right. They they suspended um, Ella French in her death, like uh, over us over another matter pr prior to her being shot and killed, sacrificing her life in the line of duty. They also, as it relates to this show. As, as it relates to the the hominess, the the uh, warm embrace of communications people, they also disciplined our friend. Um, uh, he's such a good friend. Uh, just uh, his name escapes me, and he was a Chicago police officer dispatcher uh, who took control during the Ella French uh, situation. His name is Keith Thornton. I'm being told. We uh, could just course. call him the operator now, and I count a. We love the guy so much. <laughs> right. He's our pal. Uh, in all seriousness, they uh, they disciplined Keith Thornton after that incident for the way he took uh, took command. He does need a patron saint of Dispatcher's Candle, so hopefully we'll develop something like that. We can maybe... In all seriousness, I'll say he did change the way that I dispatch and the way that I think about it. It wasn't... It was maybe a couple months after that major incident, and we had a, a bit of a horrible thing going on in the interstate and i had to get a whole bunch of resources going there damn quick and i had to um there was a gap of leadership because no one was on the scene yet and we needed to get the interstate shut down and we needed to start working on diverting traffic and figuring that all out and i knew which direction help was coming from so i just start telling them like i want you to divert traffic at this exit and we're going to set down a helicopter on the southbound side and all this and uh that's good dispatching, I guess, but it was uh, thinking of Keith and how he just took charge of a situation uh, when they're, like I said, when there's a gap of someone there to be a, an incident commander or a leader on scene. Uh, sometimes when cops are driving real fast to a thing, it doesn't hurt to have someone who can kind of sit back and take a look at the whole picture and decide what needs to get done right away. And I don't mean this in a mean way, boys, but do your thinking for you before you get there so that you could just drive safely and get there. And it was because of Keith. Uh, he taught me how to be a, a better dispatcher. And, you know, it's not really a cultural thing where I work that I could just tell people to stay off the air and shut up every time I've done that. That hasn't worked <laughs> out for me. Uh, I've never I've never been able to say, make the claim, get off my air, get off my air. I need units going now. I would love to do that every day, but I, I you know, I can't. But I'm, uh, I'm sure you would like to yell, take Route 19, take Route 19. It's the most direct route because you'd probably hear it's still not plowed. 
it's still not salted. That's so happens a lot. Actually, I had a cop get on the radio once to advise me uh, that a certain state highway uh, had snow on it. We were in the middle of a statewide snowstorm, and it was all I could do to not say, there's snow on every fucking road in the state. Why are you advising me of that? I didn't do that. Though. So here's this is the dilemma of the Tamir Rice case that I wanted to discuss. I had a uh, I had a very similar situation to this. Uh, in in the sense that it, this is definitely a critical thinking exercise. Now, w- we're going to see that there was some information, some critical information that was left out of a call. We I don't know if it was left out of the call or not. Um, it, it was definitely relayed by the caller. I don't know if it made it to the dispatcher. I don't know if she didn't hear it. I don't know what happened. So here's the scenario that I want to lay out to you, though, John, and everybody listening. I was a young corporal which means i'm a first line supervisor and uh it was towards the end of a day shift on a weekend and we get a call that there is a neighborhood dispute going on and um it escalated to the point where one neighbor was pointing a a rifle out of his window at another neighbor so we went from um just this regular run-of-the-mill kind of You know, I worked in an area where neighborhood disputes were frequent to, man, there's a guy pointing gun, there's kids everywhere and all that other stuff. So I I show up there and much to my dismay, there is uh, one deputy that is screaming, negotiating with the person on the other side of the door of the trailer. Um, They tell me they have seen a gun. They can't identify it. There's somebody holding deadly force on the door, which is good with a rifle, by the way, but like that was back before it was fashionable. And uh, there was a third that was just kind of holding deadly force with the gun. Now, while they're negotiating, I, I take a look around and I see behind me <laughs> uh, like the neighborhood just kind of milling about. And I'm I'm pretty concerned by that. So I tell all the other deputies, hey, why don't we get everybody out of the way? It could be in a crossfire situation here. And uh, there's actually an intern. You know, I look to my right, uh, and there's an intern standing next to me, like, what are you doing here? Uh, and she's like, yeah, I, I just, I, I was riding with so-and-so. And so I'm like, okay, will you go back over there? Uh, now, he, here's where the interesting dilemma comes in. And this is, this is split-second decision-making, bear in mind. Um, one of the neighbors creeps up behind me which is never really a great idea, but one of the uh, neighbors creeps up behind me and says, uh, hey, if y'all are worried about that gun, it's fake. It's a BB gun. And I said, okay. I mean, these are the same people that called us saying that the guy pointed a rifle out the thing. We also have deputies who have identified the fact that this guy was pointing a rifle out as they were pulling up. So now... I'm concerned. I'm trying to figure out what do I do here? And the dilemma is this, John. Do I creep up behind those deputies and say, hey, guys, don't worry. It's a fake. And watch them bring their temperature down or bring their um, vigilance down and everything else, only to find out an hour later It was actually real. No, you always have to treat it like it's a real incident. You can't send police officers to the scene saying, oh, he's got a fake gun or a fake knife or whatever. Like, you have to assume it's real. Okay, so this is the lead into this case because what if you did that and you knew... First of all, I'm not going to assume that it's not real anyway. But what what if you do that? Now, this guy has he's not bound by anything they shoot and kill the the person behind the the door at the trailer which they did not do luckily thank god you know uh i just got mad enough to yell at the guy to come out because i save every situation john uh, even when the power goes out so uh finally this guy just comes out come to find out it was a real gun but this guy is telling us that it's a fake gun so now i'm thinking in my mind in my own little mini after action report what if that was a fake gun and they lit that guy up six ways to eternity and 
they said uh, th- this guy behind me, the neighbor behind me, said I told those cops that it was that it was a fake gun, and then the the homicide people or the major or the colonel or the sheriff comes out and says, who did he tell that that was a fake gun? And I have to raise my hand and say, yeah, they he told me it was a fake. Gun. Yeah, no one no one wants to take take the responsibility for totally changing an incident to be fundamentally more dangerous because you're telling police officers to lower their level of response or vigilance. No one wants to be in that situation at all. And and it's so it, it's just it, it, it to me it's a it's an it's kind of sort of an ethical dilemma in the sense that I, I was going to have to live with the fact that. If they lit this guy up and it was a fake gun, the gamble that it was a fake gun, um, I, I'm going to have to live with that for the rest of my life because I could have, I could have prevented it in a sense. Uh, and, and I'm sure that that's what the uh, civil rights claim in federal court will say and everything. Well, else. in hindsight, a bad situation. If it looks bad, it's bad for the police department, and it's always going to be painted as though it could have been prevented. Always. Right. Uh, it doesn't help the officer on the scene. It doesn't help the officer that shot. It doesn't help the officer uh, that's making the decisions out there. And it certainly doesn't help the guy that's been killed. Um, so th- I think that is kind of the perfect lead into uh, what we have here. We're first going to play the 911 calls we do in, in uh, Comm Center with Drew Breezy and JB Fashion. So you're going to hear what the dispatcher hears. Just remember, hindsight is twenty twenty, and uh, hind hearing is twenty twenty. I guess you could or should say uh, in this case. So this is the number. Hello, Hollinger. Hi, how are you? I'm sitting in the park at West Boulevard by the West Boulevard Rapid Transit Station, and there was a guy in there with a pistol. You know, it's probably fake, but he's like pointing at everybody. And where are you at, sir? I'm sitting in the park at West Cudell, West Boulevard, by the West Boulevard tra- tra- Rapid Transit Station. Are you, so you're at the tra- Rapid Station? Ready to connect. Click connect to show now. Are you at the Rapid Station? No, I'm sitting across the street at the park. What's the name of the park? Cudell? Cudell, yes. The guy keeps pulling in his arms. It's probably fake, but you know what? He's scaring the shit out of him. What does he look like? So I think it's easy to miss some of this stuff because of accents and because of uh, some computer glitches, but we're going to play it all over again just so you can soak it in one more time. But essentially what he's saying is uh, he's reporting the fact that there is a guy near the rec center playing playing with a gun. He he casually mentions it's probably fake. It looks like he's a juvenile, but she's not necessarily focused on that. She's uh, understandably focused on the fact that there was a gun. We're going to play it from the beginning. So here is the 911 call. Even police, Hollinger. Hi, how are you? I'm sitting in the park at West Boulevard by the West Boulevard Rapid Transit Station. And there was a guy in there with a pistol. You know, it's probably fake, but he's like pointing at everybody. And where are you at, sir? I'm sitting in the park at West Cudell, West Boulevard by the West Boulevard Rapid Transit Station. So you're at the Rapid Station? (laughs) Are you at the Rapid Station? No, I'm sitting across the street at the park. What's the name of the park? Cudell? Cudell, yes. The guy keeps pulling in his arms. It's probably fake, but you know what? He's scaring the shit out of him. What does he look like? He has a camouflage hat on. Is he black or white? He has a gray, gray coat with black sleeves and gray pants on. Is he black or white? I'm sorry. Is he black or white? He's black. You said a camel jacket and gray pants? No, he has a camel flash hat on. You know what that is? Yeah. And storm. And on his jacket is gray, and he's got black sleeves on it. He's sitting on the swing right now, but he keeps pulling it in out of his pants and pointing at people. Probably a juvenile, you know. 
Hello? Do you know the guy? No, I do not. Sure. Okay, what's the police, okay? I'm getting ready to leave, but you know what? He's right here by the, you know, the youth center or whatever. And he keeps pulling it in and out of his pants. I don't know if it's real or not. Okay, we'll send a call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the end of the audio. John, what are your observations right off the bat? Well, first of all, you're getting conflicting things. So when people talk about this case, they're like, oh, the caller called in and said, you know, he had a fake gun. He said it a couple of times, but the last thing he says, I don't know if it's real or not. So he kind of bought back the whole fake gun thing. Yeah, it got said that the gun was fake, but by the end, he's kind of now operating from the same standpoint as you and me and police officers. Like, is it a fake gun? I guess we don't know. And Drew, I would also like you to break down as a police officer the difference between, and the, and the name of the charges is going to vary by jurisdiction, but what's the difference between brandishing a firearm and pointing it at someone? What is the legal well, difference in terms of what you would charge them with? Well, it depends. There's an improper exhibition of a firearm in the state of Florida. There's also uh, carrying a concealed firearm, and there's also the fact that he's under 21. So, um, we, of course, we wouldn't know that until it's time to, um, to you know, to deal with them. There's also there, there's all kinds of firearm related charges, such as like, you know, the commission of a felony while in possession of a firearm, whether the, they use the firearm or not. But if you're just out um, kind of twirling it around or taking it out of your wristband or playing, you know, training day with it or whatever, um, it's going to be kind of a. Um, like an improper exhibition, so to speak, uh, so to speak. And if somebody gets hurt as a result, it, it would, you know, it could easily turn into like a culpable negligence type situation. Now, what is it when you point it at somebody, Drew? Aggravated battery or aggravated assault. If there's some kind of threat associated with it, and it puts the person in fear of their life. So, and, and also in the presence of an officer, if you do that, or in the presence of somebody else who, uh, has the will to use uh, deadly force, like a citizen who has a concealed carry permit. Uh, if there's a threat of an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm, there is certainly um, the uh, uh, the it, it opens the door to using deadly force. Yes, on that and Kaylin Darby was saying that earlier this week on the Shoot Me Straight podcast with, I believe, Eddie Gallagher. He was talk. She was talking about. Our one of our favorite police officers on the show, Ben Darby, she said, in effect, you do not have to wait for the bead of the weapon to be pointed at you. If you see someone with a firearm and you have reason, reason to believe that someone, whether it's you or a bystander or another police officer is about to come to harm, you do not have to give a warning or seven warnings in the case of Ben Darby. You are authorized to use force. That's what a police officer would do if they were there seeing this kid pointing what appears to be a firearm at someone else. Drew, go ahead. This came into debate over the last uh, last breakdown we did, and I encourage you to go back and listen to that or watch that. But um, this is where the officer sh you know, showed up at the wrong house in Farmington, New Mexico. And uh, the homeowner came out, uh, uh, guns ablazing, so to speak, um, pointing the firearm at the officers, probably not knowing that they're officers. You know, I, I will certainly give them the benefit of the doubt there. but. The point is, he's would you have if you button. were on scene, though, Drew, would you have given him a benefit of a doubt if you were there? Heck no. I mean, you don't have there you, you really don't have time to react. And, and you know, I, I saw a lot of comments or I may have even replied to some of the comments on YouTube like, you know, this guy didn't shoot first or. Well, OK, well, <laughs> I, I don't know who trained you as a former police officer to wait for someone to fire upon you. Yeah, that apparently was bad training. You, you have to you have to take it around. So many people have this view of policing like yeah. it's a movie that you literally have to be in one of these situations where it's a standoff, two people pointing guns at each other, pulling back the hammer before someone has the guts to finally get in their shots first. That is not what the real what real life is. That is not what policing is. You should not wait until you are staring down the barrel of a gun before you decide that it's the right time to protect yourself or someone else. And any police officer knows that. The common person yeah. doesn't know that the kind of people who are out there saying, why doesn't he shoot him in the leg or shoot the gun out of his hand? Those are not police officers. Those are not real people. Those are not people who handle guns. Drew, go ahead. This is this is in the pile of things that people just don't understand, such as, well, why did they shoot him 31 times or uh, why did they shoot him in the back? 
um, deadly force is deadly force. It doesn't matter where the bullet lands or where the bullet enters the body. And the body does funky things when people are trying to get away and they're shooting at you or they're pointing a gun at you. Um, and the other thing is too, it's not like old time ETV where you shoot the guy and he grabs his heart and just kind of starts doing a herky jerky and then falls to his knees and, uh, shooting somebody could mean he's standing straight up, uh, and you could hit him four, six, eight, ten times, and he's still standing. And what are you supposed to be doing at that point? Like the goal probably, or, or the goal should not be just to kill somebody, but the goal is to stop the threat, stop and the neutralize the threat. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Neutralize the threat. And if the, if the threat isn't neutralized, you keep going. And, and that's, that's, was, wasn't that's an that unfortunate case that part. was, um, I'm trying to remember it. I'm sorry. I, I don't remember the name, but we recently had, oh gosh, I'm conflating things now, but there was a, there was a guy who he attempted to steal somebody's taser. I believe maybe I'm mixing two cases up, but he was shot by a whole bunch of police officers who all re reacted to the same threat at the same time. He was shot a lot. And when asked why he was shot so many times, the public information officer, the chief, the sheriff said, because they ran out of bullets. That's why he was well, shot that yeah. many times. Yeah, you are conflating a few stories. That was Grady Judd that said that. Um, Sorry, uh, there's a couple good stories in there. Just pay attention yeah. to the one that I meant, not the ones I <laughs> didn't mean. But it's true. I mean, uh, Jalen Walker was the case where everybody kind of uh, shot at the same time to kind of deflate the argument that it was sympathetic fire. Everybody saw the threat at the same time. Uh, so several people shot, and it looked like it was just excessive, like everybody just was having a field day or whatever. But no, you have six or seven individuals with guns, and they're all kind of... Uh, just making the determination that there's a threat in front of them. And it, it's sad they, that I can't keep police shooting straight anymore, but we live in a civilization right, now that doesn't have respect for law enforcement. Drew, go ahead. No, 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 no. You're right. Uh, so, you know, just, just, that's, that is just, my point was, that's just in the pile of things that, that people don't understand. They think that, um, they think that, uh, this is like excessive force or they think this is um, us just piling on or having a field day or just wanting to use our guns or play with our toys or no, this is real life. And and these are the things that people don't understand. Like how can you shoot him in the back? E even the, the, the alleged uh, shooting in the back of Mike Brown, which was not true. I mean, if he did, if he was shot in the back, it was because he was falling um, and a bullet landed in his back. That's, kind of neither neither here nor there like when you have use when you have the authority to use deadly force it doesn't matter where the bullet lands your your, your focus is to neutralize the threat so i don't want to keep uh, perseverating on that fact but that's no that's but i case. mean it's been important in the last couple episodes and it kind of comes up here again is when when are the police justified to use force according to the public who knows nothing about real life and having guns put it at them most of the time or policies or what's reasonable or what's reasonable for a police officer versus what's reasonable for a common citizen. And that's why we have to unpack these things. The point of this show is to, you know, show what it, it, the truth of law enforcement is and versus what's depicted in the films and what Don Lemon or someone like him would say on TV is a reasonable thing for a police officer to do. But go ahead, Drew. Um, okay, so there is reasonable and then there's uh, what everybody thinks should be reasonable. And uh, we all know that it's what a reasonable officer would do. It's not what a reasonable citizen would do because we're trained differently. Um, and that's just the reality of the business. So we're going to look at the video at this point. Now, there are there are issues uh, that came of this and, you know, we'll discuss them. But here uh, we may have to narrate some of this because I don't think there's sound in this. The video footage is that of uh, a snowy ground. Uh, there's a gazebo. You can kind of make out a shadowy figure sitting at the picnic table. That's what the guy on the phone is describing. And the officers approach from the right side of your screen. You can see the subject stand up. That's Tamir Rice. He's walking towards the front of the gazebo. The car literally pulls up on the grass. And as the passenger police officer pulls out, you see Tamir doubled over. And then you see the, the driver officer run to the front of the car the passenger officer run for cover to the back of the car and they immediately get on the radio and say, you know, shots fired and, and everything else. It wasn't immediately clear to the dispatcher that um, they had fired the shots and it wasn't immediately clear that they had hit the, the suspect, which became an issue later on. But the, that's what you're seeing there in that video. It happened that quick. 
according to the officer that was in the passenger seat, who was a, a rookie at that point, um, he uh, yelled through the window, show me your hands, show me your hands, show me hand, show me your hands. Uh, or he yelled as he was getting out of the car, show me your hands, show me your hands. Within two seconds, he shot Tamir Rice. The, the gun, by the way, uh, the reason reasoning behind it was th- they were yelling, show me your hands, show me your hands. He went straight to his waistband. And um, you can see the on the video, there, there are plenty of videos for you to review on YouTube of this shooting. Uh, th- there's no shortage of that. In fact, um, as you can imagine, uh, again, the, the elephant in the room is that uh, Tamir is a 12-year-old black male. And, you know, God rest his soul, he was a kid playing around with a toy gun. And uh, perhaps he didn't understand the full consequences of, of playing around with a toy gun, but the gun looked so real that somebody called 911 and said, hey, there's a guy with a gun playing with it out here and we need you to address it. Nobody knows what the guy's intentions are. Nobody knows that he's 12 years old at the time the bullets leave the, the officer's gun. Uh, in fact, you know, you, you'll see some compelling testimony of the uh, the driver, the FTO, the officer that that says, you know, then he's trying to describe like then we look down and we see this kid he's she shot in the abdomen and he's just a kid you know and it's just like a just like this moment of gravity while he's giving his interview and he just breaks down crying like it's just it's a horrible horrible tragedy i feel uh horrible for the kid i feel horrible for the kid's family his mother is very vocal about this whole thing but we uh are in the united states of america and unfortunately this is an automatic reason to call this race-based this is an automatic reason to say two white police officers got out of a car and shot this 12 year old black boy um we're, we're gonna we're gonna neglect to tell everybody that this gun looked real we're gonna we're gonna neglect to tell everybody that there was actually a working magazine that came out of the gun there was no orange barrel that would denote uh, that it was a toy gun that he reached for the gun as the officers were coming up, probably because he didn't know what to do because 12 year old kids maybe don't, uh, or maybe he was trained. I don't know. But the, the bottom line is he went for this gun and it was, it was seen on the ground behind him. So obviously he pulled the gun out as the officers were, were pulling up completely tragic situation. Uh, and very, and- very tragic, but don't forget to add that a reasonable person dialed 911 an emergency line believing that an emergency existed in the park and that people might be in danger from a firearm yeah he said it could be a toy but uh, he also kind of said maybe it's not and i would i would put forward to you and this is not something that's legally durable or an aha gotcha moment but it's tacitly implied by the mere fact that he's dialing 911 that there's a good chance that it's real because a fake toy is just sort of a you know or a fake gun it's not really something that needs to be addressed by the police. I mean, kind of, yes, but I mean, it's not an emergency because they're not capable of killing someone with a toy gun. However, this man dialed 911 and said, looks like a, maybe a fake gun, but maybe it's not. I don't know. Plus, you have just the whole tacit 911 call that says an emergency exists. Drew, go ahead. Um, the, 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 w- the honest headline would read, uh, officer shoots boy with, with what he thought was a gun. but. The, the obvious um, w- what today's media wants to portray and what they want to uh, instill into the black community uh, and uh, perpetuate this mistrust of police officers. They say white officer kills young black child who had a toy gun. There's no way to tell that that was a toy gun. G- g- see for yourself. Go on and line and look. The, the other thing is, this was all, you know, there was a judge that found probable cause to send this to a grand jury. The grand jury agreed, there's no way you can charge these officers. It was reasonable. They, they, didn't, they didn't know that it was a toy, and there was somebody reaching for a gun as they're pulling up. I think the only argument that could be made is that they put themselves in that position. They came a little bit too close, but that's, that's up to the grand jury, and the grand jury made the decision. The Department of Justice did the same thing. They spent a couple years scrutinizing this case, as a matter of fact, and uh, during the Trump administration, closed the case. They determined that the officers acted in a reasonable manner and that this case was, should be closed. The, uh, the settlement from the city 
was uh, somewhere in the area of five million dollars. Six I, okay. million dollars for mom. Okay, it was it was six. No, it wasn't for mom. It was five point five million dollars for uh, Tamir Rice's estate. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the mom, and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the sister. And the reason they got paid was um, the sister went rushing to the scene to to tend to her little brother, and she was tackled. And the mother wouldn't calm down once they told her what happened to the point where they had to detain her. This has happened before. Like people are in such a panic and they're so hateful towards um, the police. Like uh, maybe the anger is not, you know, a criminal reaction, but the the anger is just like so um, out of control that the officers feel the need to kind of detain her and put her in the backseat of a car to calm her down a little bit. And she got paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that. Of course, they, you know, whatever they do with the Tamir's estate is is their business. But as an um, aside, though, they had to go and inform the mom she wasn't at the park. She was right. watching the child, twelve year old, without being supervised. What was the providence of the fake gun that was probably altered to look real? Because I don't. I mean, maybe maybe if it was just a pellet gun, you can get those things and they look pretty re- real. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but the, the, there, there's a good, I'm sorry, there's a good news story, uh, uh, uh that, uh, before this took its, its turn, um, before it took its like completely racist overtone, um, the, the media was doing their job in, in tracking down people. One of the people they tracked down was a young kid who said, I warned him about that gun. I gave him that gun before, you know, 30 minutes prior to that. And I warned him about it. Don't be playing with this thing. It looks real. The, the video is available on YouTube. America's not going to watch it. Uh, uh, but I'll, you know, I'll tell you it's there. I saw it myself. So go ahead, John. I'm sorry. No, it's it just, I almost want to, I almost, I'll just put you on the spot. Do you want to open up the can of worms that is the mother or do you just want to leave her in peace on this show? I'll, I'll leave her in peace because I don't think this is, this is uh, comparable to, and this might ruffle a few feathers still but this is comparable to trying to convince the parents at uvaldi that th- there are extenuating circumstances of why the officers did what the officers did you're never going to convince them of that and you're never well, going to convince this mother that as a matter of fact when she was presented with they showed her the officer the the, the veteran officer breaking down during his interview And she said, good, he should cry all he wants because he's going to hell and he's going to have to live in hell. So she's not, it's, it's not like she's uh, forgiving and anytime they need an expert, they go to her to ask her what her opinion is on these shootings. But I I'm just frankly sick and tired of them automatically being labeled as racist shootings. And there's no accountability whatsoever of the behavior of the person that was shot. I understand this is a complete tragedy. This is a 12 year old boy who was playing with a gun and some police officers pulled up and, and maybe he panicked and whatever, uh, and was tragically killed. But we, we in America, not us in, uh, excluded have to go to the fact that this is automatically racist and take it from there. We never take it from 10 steps before that to determine if there, if race was even a factor, just the same as, Derek Chauvin sitting on um, uh, uh, George Floyd's neck or, you know, he was on his shoulders, but just Derek Chauvin sitting on his, his neck is automatically a racist issue. He's Derek Chauvin is a racist. Like we have to accept that on the surface. It never comes up at trial, of course, but it's perpetuated by the media. It's, it's almost like we can't community. prove beyond a shadow of a doubt what's in someone's heart, Drew. It's almost like that's not real. And yet, we have hate crimes in this country which purport to convict someone based on what's there in their heart. But go ahead. No, you're that's you're saying what I'm thinking. It's just it's a matter of like you have to accept that on its face that this is a racially motivated incident. But but it never comes up in an official proceeding. No one ever swears to it. No one ever says we are charging you with uh, an aggravated murder because it is racially motivated. You will never hear that. You, you just hear that in the media, that black, it, it was the, it was the example I gave in the, the, the fake master class I gave where, you know, it was, uh, I, I can't remember what the one shooting was. Uh, oh, it was the old man. It was the, you know, the 86 year old man who shot the young black boy who, who had 
rang the doorbell of the wrong house. And then the next story on CNN was uh, 14 people were sh shot, four were murdered at a birthday party, but they didn't mention the race of anybody involved because it's not, it doesn't evoke any emotion. It doesn't pull any emotion out. And, and to me, that's sinister. That's dirty. Well, you, you can't, you can't do that to undermine an entire community like that. That's, that's not fair. Exactly. And I'll take the most controversial stance I've ever taken. Racism is reprehensible. And I've said before that it's the worst thing in our society that requires the least amount of proof. But it should not be against the law to be racist because you are policing someone's thoughts and you're policing their beliefs and your freedom to think what you want to think and say what you want to think means you are free to be a reprehensible dumbass. It is not the job of the government to punish you for having racist thoughts. And so when you take someone and you convict them of a hate crime, you are elevating the status of whoever that victim is, whatever that protected status and says, well, if you're a black person or a homosexual person or whatever it is that your status is that qualifies this as a hate crime, and you say that person is a, more of a special status. The truth is, if you're going to go out and you're going to assault someone or you're going to kill them or whatever you're going to do, whatever in your heart doesn't matter because all people are equal in this country or we're supposed to be. And those crimes should all be treated as equally reprehensible, regardless of the victim. Drew, I have been fired. Go ahead. You're fired and you are rehired. You're canceled and uh, you, are, you have been elevated to uh, host once again. Um, so you're, you're right on all counts. Uh, I, I'll take a cue from Adam Carolla. What a time to be a racist, right? Because an actual racist can get away with murder right now because we're all considered racist. Like it, it, it is watered down so much to the point that everything is racism that actual racists like KKK people, or uh, they can operate with free will because we're all kind of lumped into one category, especially if you wear a red hat, it doesn't matter what it says. It doesn't matter if, if you're anti-Trump or not. Uh, if you wear a red hat, apparently you're automatically a racist. So that's kind of all I have on this case. I mean, it, it's, it, it starts with the ethical dilemma of, uh, you know, I guess we should mention that the dispatcher in this That's case what was... what I was going to get at, yeah. She was, sus oh, go she, was yeah, go. she was suspended eight days, and not to keep going back to the mother, but she said, only eight days? The system is broken. And, and without opening the can of worms somehow, I have to address the fact that your little boy was shot, and it is the system's fault. It was never the mother's fault for not keeping a juvenile under supervision or making sure that he would never be placed in a situation in which he would be in any kind of danger. Let's take the police out of the situation. Suppose he's out there playing with the park and he's got a, a toy gun and random person, you could say uh, Johnny uh, Concealed Carry or you know, Freddie Scumbag from the Bloods and the Crips or whatever. You're out there and you have a situation with a person with a gun. You have no idea how other people are going to react to that, except with a high probability of lethal force. A child should never be in possession of a gun, obviously, let alone a, a toy gun, waving it around, acting that way to park. And the system that first failed that boy, which you can make arguments any way you want, but was the maternal system because your child should not be out there doing that. So her for her to, to rail against the dispatcher and say, you know, eight hours uh, or eight days of suspension is not enough. She's out for blood. I don't know what you could do to that dispatcher that would bring back the life of a 12 year old boy or somehow equalize that i mean are we supposed to fire her and kill her too i mean where does it end and before you start pointing fingers at other people just point them at yourself first that's all i ask drew go ahead well i i guess the 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 question i would have is what what neg what did she did what did she do that was negligent now that the, there may be an argument i haven't read the cat call i don't know what's in the cat call so i don't know if she put in there that it may be fake or whatever obviously that didn't convey to, convey to the dispatcher and the dispatcher still has to make to a radio dispatcher has still has a, a decision to make of whether the, you know they're going to relay that information if they even see it so um again when you get a call about a person with a gun you're going to treat it like a yeah, person you, with a gun. It, it, you can't say it's possibly fake because you're putting a police officer's life in danger because what if it's real? Obviously, you're supposed to err on the side of caution. You're supposed to resolve all doubt in your favor. You would not tell a police officer that he's about to go face down with someone with a fake gun unless you know the thing's obviously orange. Some They were throwing it around. They picked it up out of a pond and they're still pointing it. 
you know, it's inflatable. I don't know, but it's just some really, really, really obvious not gun situation. But in case that when there's obviously some doubt about it to the point where a 911 call is, you're not going to tell the police officer this thing's a fake gun. Make sure you don't blow away the kid. Now, Drew, I have to ask you this because you mentioned Uvalde. We talk about police officers not being, uh, you know, they're not charging into the scene. They're not taking care of the suspect right away. This is a situation where police officers zoomed right in there and uh, stopped it. And it turned out it wasn't a threat to anyone, and that's why we're in the situation that we're in. But as a lieutenant and as a you know a supervisor of patrol, not to criticize the police officers, but would you have done something different tactically? Would you have tried to approach differently? Would you have more officers in the area? Would you have tried to set up a, a perimeter? Would you have assessed you know who's in danger based on in the, who's in the area? Like if it was you, I guess I just want to know, given the given the advantage of hindsight, knowing you wouldn't have had that if you were these officers. Okay, so I'm not going after them because I don't have hindsight. But given hindsight, Drew, what would you think about doing it differently? Just as a thought um, experiment, go ahead. I don't know that I can say that uh, definitively because I don't know how many man with a gun calls they respond to in Cleveland. And, and I don't know, I, I could tell you probably from my experience where, you know, where I was patrolling maybe wasn't as densely populated. So uh, perhaps I would have given myself some distance if I was the only one there. If I was the first one there, I would have given myself some distance and maybe used the PA uh, and treated it like a felony stop and if it's a real gun you're going to know pretty quickly but at least you have some distance in between um uh, you know as far as waiting for backup i mean they had the guy on the phone or it wasn't like you know uh the caller was saying yeah the guy's getting ready to walk into the rec center so um though you don't want to drag your feet going there you you definitely uh time may have been on your side a little bit to wait for backup but here's the here's the what people are I think discounting as well. These, uh, this, this officer and his trainee were on the way, and he said, uh, he, he even said in his uh, interview, he said, I looked over at the, the kid and I said, okay, we got a man with a gun call. What are you going to do? And they start bouncing scenarios off of one another, which is, which is great. This is exactly what training is all about, and this is what keeping each other safe is all about. And he said, well, um, I'm probably going to draw my gun and blah, blah, blah. And I, I believe the FTO even said at one point, this is a man with a gun call. You're going to roll up there with the gun on your lap. And he followed those directions. I mean, it's just it's it's not even a matter of priming because obviously the kid reached for a gun. It, mm -hmm. Even if they had written in the call, this could be a fake gun. He still reached for it and he still yeah. threw it. And I, I, I and imagine he was that. probably trying to grab it to surrender it to him. Maybe, you know, who knows? Possibly. But the point is, the point is he, he was reaching for it and, and you, you, you're not psychic in that moment. You know, the public wants you to be psychic and all knowing and understand this is a 12 year old when you, you've been there for fractions of a second, your brain's still catching up with what just happened. You're, you know, you're, you, you're mentally, you're still on the side of the car and you're standing there, you know, pointing a gun at a kid. That's how fast that it happens. And so it's, so it's, let me, let me summarize ahead. it this way. 75% of the country is outraged at the speed at which this took place, that this, this officer yelled whether he was still inside the car or outside of the car, and within two seconds had shot this young boy in the abdomen. But two seconds is an eternity when it comes to gunplay. Now, so we're going with 75% of the country that's outraged, 25% that's kind of like, mm, okay, I see it, or I get it. Now, let's, let's reverse the roles. Let's say that this wasn't a fake gun and let's say that they rolled up there and that this officer got out of the car. Do you think 75% of the country would be like, oh my God, I'm in mourning over this officer? Because that's not the case. That's never going to happen. It's still the 25% that are saying, Jesus, this guy, this poor cop never had the time to react. The guy, it was two seconds. It just happened so fast. He, he got out of the car and this guy plugged him two times in the head and then he tried to shoot his partner. Two seconds is an eternity for either party. It just depends on who who receives the bullet that makes the two seconds short or long, right? That's a, that's a great perspective, absolutely. Okay, well, that's what I do is provide great perspectives, John. I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to provide some. Well, uh, I, I mean, I mean, I you know, I recently saw a meme about people who play devil's advocates and how it turns out they're just dicks. But I guess I would say to you, you know, those two seconds on either side of a. Uh, of a uh you know whether it's a 12 year old boy or it's a, a legitimate suspect with a real firearm in those two seconds uh yeah. you know training being a huge difference you know what is two seconds to an officer who obviously knows 
you know, he's going oh, to that situation and he knows how to, how to dial that in. Whereas, you know, the common citizen, maybe not so good. Maybe I, what I'm talking about, is just a different a difference of marksmanship, but just to kind of be a dick, you know, I'm sort of uh, playing devil's advocate to you about how two seconds, you know, you could still say that's different for trained police officers and the common citizen. Eviscerate that. Go ahead. Uh, no, there's no way to do that. So, well, what's the, the 21 foot rule is about edged weapons. And that means that, uh, if somebody is within 21 feet of you, you would not have the time f for the closing speed of the person with the edge weapon for you to get your gun out of your holster mm -hmm. and fire at them. So think of that. That's probably, you know, in the area of two seconds. Like that's yeah. that's how that's the eternity of two seconds. Yet it's the brevity of two seconds. I don't understand. Like, I don't know how else to put it. Like two seconds is an eternity. It just depends on which side of the bullet you're on. No, I, I like that perspective. And it's um, uh, just it kind of just brings you back to the tactile, tactical aspect of it, because we did know this was a pistol of whatever kind, real or not real. And the police officers show up. They, the car, if you watch the video, they literally pull up right into the effective range of the boy. Maybe they were trying to surprise him almost like a, you know, a flashbang as you enter a door. I think maybe it was kind of like that, that they were trying to get a psychological advantage over him as they approached the scene. Yeah. But the, the, I don't know the reasoning behind that. I, I think they even discussed that in their interviews. Um, now, let, let's remember, too, the kids started moving. The, the, the kids started walking. So perhaps they didn't see him in the gazebo. Maybe they came up on him a little bit too quickly and didn't realize, holy shit, he's right there. Um, there are a couple other things that we need to address. One of them being the officer that shot and killed him was fired. He was fired from the Cleveland Police Department, not for the shooting, but for uh, what they called, I think, untruthfulness on his application because he was uh, a, a, an employee of a different police department somewhere else, and they terminated his employment during his training because he had a breakdown on the range. Now, what what that means to the media is let's frenzy this and talk about how this guy was involved with guns and and couldn't handle a, his uh, his business. Uh, and now the Cleveland Police Department has, and now he kills a 12-year-old boy. What it actually what actually happened is, and I, I had to freeze the YouTube video to read the memo, um, he was going through some relationship issues, and he uh, just was not concentrating properly. And he had done some very stupid stuff when he was in training. One of them was leaving his locker unsecured. Uh, and, and this was at a different apartment now. It's not at Cleveland. So he left his locker unsecured with his gun in it after he had been issued the gun. He had the breakdown at the range where he couldn't do the drills because he was just in a, an emotional mess in a bad state because of a girlfriend issue. So they wrote uh, this uh, termination memo that just essentially said, you know, I, I don't feel that his maturity level is, is that he's ready to be a police officer with our agency. And they terminated him. They said, okay, because you can do that. When somebody's on probation, you don't have to pass them through your probationary period. Uh, it's, it's an at-will situation at that point. You can just terminate. As long as you, you know, you're not doing it for uh, nefarious reasons, you got to be able to justify it. And they justified it with this memo or with this, uh, with this letter or whatever. So he goes on to apply for the Cleveland Police Department at somebody else's urging. And I guess he doesn't fully disclose what, or, or, or maybe he interprets it differently of why he was terminated from this other position, or, you know, maybe he phrases it as he chose not to work there. That's me paraphrasing it. I don't know exactly if that's what happened. So when they, they were just under so much pressure from the community that they said, they took a look at this and they said, okay, good enough. You're fired. And they fired him. So he went to go work somewhere else recently. We're talking about the last two months or three months. And just before he was sworn in, they uh, it was a one person police department and just before he was sworn in somebody got to the mayor and said hey you know who that is that's the kid the kid that's the guy that killed tamir rice and mysteriously he's out of a job again so he'll never he'll never work in police you know whether he was justified or not whether the department of justice said he was justified whether the grand jury said he was justified whether his agency said he was justified uh public opinion says he was not and he will never work in law enforcement again just based on those arbitrary rules that we throw on people because this was an outrageous case because of the kid's age. Again, we're skipping a lot of steps 
the, the kid's age means he probably shouldn't have been playing with a gun that looks so real. But we're not talking about that. Well, and, no one should be playing with a gun. I mean, when they roll up on scene, did, I mean, did they they thought it was possibly a juvenile? I don't know if the juvenile thing made it through the radio, but that doesn't matter to the, me, though. Man with a gun. I mean, well, exactly. It was exactly what I was getting at is that it doesn't doesn't matter if he's 12. He could still shoot someone. In fact, in some ways, it's possible that, you know, he doesn't appreciate the gravity of holding a firearm and maybe he's more reckless, you know. So and but they rolled up on him so fast. They didn't be like, oh, this is an innocent 12 year old. Unfortunately, that kind of reckoning didn't take place until he was af until after he was shot. I'm not saying it that it should have changed anything. It's just it's especially sad because he is 12 years old. And circling back to what I said before, because it's so bad, it's going to be presented as though it could have been prevented, which I'm just not sure that it could have been. Drew, go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I, I just don't want this to seem like an opportunistic uh, uh, broadcast that we're, we're choosing this to pile on the mother or we're choosing this to talk about race or we're i mean it's an important issue when it comes to communications and when it comes to law enforcement and that's what we do that's that's what the show is about so, uh we, so we what do you think about the eight day suspension then i i don't I, I said a minute ago i don't know that i i wasn't able to read the cat call so i don't know what okay. she put in there i i don't know that this is a training issue though because here's the deal when you hear man with a gun, you think description. I want to know who the officers are rolling up on. All this superfluous information, which turns out to be very, very relevant in hindsight, uh, is not relevant to you. What's relevant is he's wearing a gray hoodie, he's got a camouflage cap on, and he's a black male. And as you pointed out, just like last week and just like this week, the caller doesn't want to say he's a black male. And this is, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm stereotyping here, but I believe the dispatcher's black. So she's not uncomfortable asking, and mm -hmm. nobody should be uncomfortable. She's, this, is, this is what's wrong with America. This is what's perpetuating these problems. Someone's afraid to say, yes, that's a black male with a camouflage cap, blah, 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 because as a police officer, as a human being, as whatever, that's the first thing you're going to eliminate. You're, you're gonna you can eliminate 50 percent of the population essentially when you roll up and there's 16 people standing there if they said it's a white kid and he's standing in a group of black kids all the black kids step aside i want to talk to that guy yeah it works both ways but you have to know the description so just knowing the description is not racist inherently i no. just want to know is it a black male or a white male it's a white male or you should, should ask him like three times and to get him to say that because he was caught up on right. like camouflage this and all that. He didn't want so to while say she, right. So while she's typing and she's she's putting in pertinent information, he's throwing in he's peppering in little details such as he looks like a kid, could be a fake gun. Yeah, any gun could be a fake gun. Anybody could be a kid. It doesn't the the, the, the age of the um the age of the kid, as long as he's strong enough to pull the trigger, that's what matters. You know, if it's an infant holding a gun, I think that's a, probably a different urgency. But, um, you know, she's just trying to get it. So I think I think eight days was probably, and I don't know the rest of the story. I don't know what went into the discipline. So I, I do, just on the surface, and I hate doing this because, again, I'd like to get all the facts, but you don't know eight enough, days yeah. seems to be a little bit way too punitive. It seems to be like that they were they were pressured socially to do something about this. Uh, you know, eight days, you can't punish somebody because you cost the agency $5 million. Uh, as long as they were operating within their guidelines, she's a human being. And she, God forbid, she doesn't want to see a 12 year old kid get shot. And no, killed. of course not. And then she doesn't want to see an officer get shot and killed either. And that's, no. that's her priority at that moment. So I thought, I thought she handled the call. Well, you know, we, there's the missing piece, like you alluded to is we don't know the call details. We don't know what the M you know, what went out to over the radio and what went on to the MDT. And of course, I would say that if officers responding to a man with a gun aren't reading the computer, they're just driving. Um, right. But it, they, they had to punish someone, you know, like, like when I said, when it looks bad, you've got to, you've got to find somebody to blame. It's always the case because the dispatcher was heavily involved in this case. She was punished too, but it's, it's such not, a weird uh, number to me, I guess, eight days, you know, not five days, not 
not 10 days, eight days, you know, a week and a half. It just, it's strange to me. So I'm just wondering kind of what, you know, if you, if you, if you have ever suspended a dispatcher and why and for how long, and what would that be comparable to in your experience, if you have any? Well, I, yes, I have. I've demoted a dispatcher. I've, I've suspended some dispatchers, but I mean, n not over stuff like this, like that, you know, if you're looking at this subject, if we're looking at the reasonableness of the officer shooting, why aren't we looking at the reasonableness of her, in, uh, you know, what she input? Now, the other part of this is, and and I, I think sometimes in disciplinary cases, you can hang your hat on this. They're heavily protected by unions. And they also, uh, she also very specifically did not, um, I, I don't want to say she didn't cooperate, but she didn't talk. She didn't say specifically she was represented by an attorney at that point. So she didn't say specifically what her frame of mind is or why she did or why she didn't put stuff into the call. So when the sheriff's office that was investigating this tried to uh, ask her about it, she just said, look, my attorney said not to answer that. So they'll never have the true answer because she was told not to do it. And as a result of it, they're like, OK, well, the only thing that we can go on is what we think happened and we're going to discipline you based on that. So perhaps that's a scenario that, that, that took place, but you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't, I don't think it's fair. I, I think again, um, the whole reason for doing this show is to point out how tough this job actually is and how much scrutiny these people take and to understand that they're not, they're not treated as first responders or officers. They don't get the same retirement. They don't get the same pay. They certainly have the same responsibilities and they, they get the same, they get the same social pressures that, that police do. It's, it's a very thankless job. So this is, you know, one of the reasons why we're teaming up to do this. Do you have any final words on this uh, case before we go to voicemails? No, let's brighten up the place with some voicemails. I'm all, I got all hot and bothered like 10 times and I got on my soapbox very early on. And I don't think I ever climbed down. Some well, voicemails would help me feel better. You're, um, you're, uh your brain working in overdrive actually shut my power down so i oh. don't appreciate that sorry here are some voicemails let's play them tragically oh I hold on a second that sounds there like jim from hey, john florida Drew, this is jim from florida just finished listening to your episode on the uh response to the wrong address which ended up tragically i appreciate both of your take on how the dispatcher acted and reacted and and how that process goes through with their feelings and uh, the way the calls all seem to hammer out. Keep up the good work, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, John and Drew. It's Andrew from Midwest. You know, I uh, was going through my news feed tonight, and I just wanted to give a shout out to an amazing officer from Louisville PD, Officer Nicholas Wilt. Officer Wilt is currently fighting for his life after having been involved in an active shooter incident in Louisville on April 10th of this year. Officer Wilt was shot in the head. This kid was 10 days out of the police academy. He was on his fourth shift. A brand new rookie officer was the him and his FTO were the first responders on the scene. They immediately engaged with this individual who was actively shooting up a bank. And this officer was hit, unfortunately, in the crossfire. They did an amazing job after the fact. The, the other officers responding did an amazing job of subduing the subject. And I just want to put, put out thoughts and prayers to Officer Wilt and all the other officers involved. And I pray for a speedy recovery for him. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Hello, Com Center. It's another perimeter check with Micah. I'm just questioning things this evening had a lot of questions on the situation earlier and believe it or not i had an inmate tell me some some false truths half truths and outright lies i uh, told him as much when i figured out tried to get the totality of the situation that he sits on the throne of lies and had to communicate with the other sergeants and people that work here so that we're all on the same team often inmates Use, try to use each other against each other often like a, a child uses one parent against the other and I just don't want to allow that but it's just making me question things I mean do 
media has told me that these people are just made honest mistakes and I'm just flabbergasted that they lied straight to my face. But, but anyways, the week is almost over to come in tomorrow for some training and my short day and looking forward to the next episode of Com Center. We'll see you then. We have one last one. I just wonder if uh, that inmate he was talking about was a member of the Scorpions. Hey, guys. It's Teresa Kay. Um, just calling to tell you that you guys are killing it. Like, you're doing so great between your topics that you choose weekly and interacting in the chat. has just been really awesome, and it's been really cool to watch how you evolved and have grown since episodes, you know, one, two, and three, a little rough, but um, you're getting through it. And it's, it's just been awesome to be part of it and to watch you. Um, Y'all should be so proud. Um, I know I'm proud of you boys. And um, I do apologize. I'm still under the weather, um, so to speak. Um, This North Carolina sickness I brought back with me. Thank you, Jonathan. um, Has, you know, it's been a bummer. It's a cold, by the way. It's it just a cold. From enjoying a good show with you two <laughs> and watching Com Center, and yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that, like, so proud of you, and so proud of what you're doing and the topics that you choose and the way you present it and the way you know you interact in the chats. Um, has just been great to be a part of, and I really look forward to all the upcoming shows. I hope you guys are doing well and feeling better. And um, I hope you have an awesome day. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye. Hey, guys. Thank you, Teresa Kay, one of uh, Michigan's finest. And, uh, you know, you Michigan is what we'll... mom. She, she's just like congratulating us on like graduating from third grade is what it sounds <laughs> I, like. I'm talking... Oh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I'm talking good. And uh, and, and the, <laughs> that was adorable. Uh, tomorrow, Michigan will be the topic in our discussion with Matthew Mistretta, who was uh, who is essentially hunted down by the attorney general of Michigan. Uh, we'll get to hear all about that as uh, as Matthew, in an ominous foreshadowing, said to me, Uh, Yeah, they found me not guilty, and boy, did they make a big mistake in in gagging me during that because I am ready to talk. So uh, please make sure you join us. Uh, I thank you for joining us tonight. John, you do amazing work. John put together the the video that you watched with the the call in it and the the, uh, surveillance video. So thank you for doing that. John, also, uh, I curse you for shutting off my power. Yeah. Uh, Believe I'm, me, I'm sorry. I was doing the show from by myself again there for a little bit, uh, <laughs> dancing away. I uh, wanted to just echo those thoughts about the police officers in Louisville. Uh, we are thinking about you. That's just awful that you're just out of the academy and then uh, your career and your life has changed forever. And you, you're, you're at the very start and you want to help your community uh, like another uh, police officer out there in Louisville that we all know and love around here. And uh, it's a case that we're looking at possibly for next week. Um, as far as Micah goes, man, maybe take somebody with you on those perimeter checks. You're out there a long time looking at the stars, wondering what it all means and <laughs> having to deal with the fact that people are lying to you and what you've been told otherwise. And it's just a whole big conflict in your mind. I feel for you because I used to do a lot of like 3 a.m. Pro- perimeter checks in which I seriously evaluated my life and not just because it was 25 below at the time. But uh, I feel for you, Micah. Hopefully you get some of that resolved. And Jim, yeah, as or- always, thanks for your uh- kind comments like have a safe or, or a healthy outlet like smoking like take up smoking or something smoke or you know any kind of uh, habitual thing uh alcohol or whatever but the main yeah. thing you need to do if you are stressed out and this isn't for no matter what your job is make sure you do not talk to your family the people that care about you remember that they cannot understand isolate. Make sure you isolate yourself exactly from from the things you enjoy give up your hobbies do not <laughs> exercise do not do not uh, talk with anyone but first responders. Make sure you're talking to first responders about with the stuff that's wrong at home. That's definitely a great idea. And uh, uh, did I mention alcohol? Drew, go ahead. Yeah. And by all means, if, if anybody asks if you're okay, uh, please respond with gritted teeth. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, no, all of that was bad advice. If you are struggling, uh, call 848-COM-911. 
uh, reach out to us. We will not play everything on the air, but if you are having a hard time and you want to talk to Drew, who's been around the corner a few times and me about half as many times, you could talk to us. Maybe we could see if we could uh, just help you out by listening and talk to you about it. Or maybe, you know, if we need to send you towards another resource, that's not a problem, guys. You can talk about your stuff and don't, don't, uh, don't think that uh, there's no solution or you just have to deal with it. There's a way There's a way out of how you're feeling and it doesn't have to get as bad as what Micah is going through. John, will you do me a favor and stick around till tomorrow uh, when, uh, well, actually till next week when we are together as a comm center family. Uh, this is uh, Drew Breezy with JB, my right hand. Wolf good night. Hat. We love you. Good night. Stop saying good night.